Like I said, it's, good, it's so good to be with you guys. Um, we are in a series where we are um, looking at this book of Jonah. Um, and it's, uh, it's about a prodigal prophet. And you know, when you think of the prodigal son, it's the son who ran physically. And then it's the son who was running from the father emotionally, where he didn't trust the older son, the older son and the younger son. And, you know, a few thousand years before this story of, that Jesus tells, we see a prophet with the same heart running from God. Um, actually, um, if you remember the plot line, Jonah is called to the great city, the Assyrian pagan city of Nineveh. And he refuses. And instead of going to Nineveh, he hops on a boat and goes the opposite direction to Tarshish, which was present day, which is present day of uh, Spain. He pays his fare. He goes um, to the bottom of the boat and uh, takes a nap, goes to sleep. That's just about as comfortable as you can get running from God. Just as numb as he could be to God. And it just revealed that. It revealed that. But then God always has his way, as we said. He sends a storm. He gets Jonah's attention with a big fish. And now you might think right now, we're going to jump from chapter 1 to chapter 2. You know, here we go next, but not so quick. We're going to spend a little bit more time. Because while we have this main plot, we're actually given this subplot that's going on. We're actually given a part, it's a, and really it's a part of the main plot. It's, you see this crew on the boat and you know Jonah's called to the big pagan city well there's a big pagan crew on the boat that didn't know God and and all of a sudden they didn't know Yahweh they didn't know God but after Jonah after they throw Jonah into the sea and we think let's go to chapter 2 see what happens we've got to pause because it says in verse 16 I'll read the passage in a moment just said this at this the men greatly feared the Lord all caps Yahweh and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, Yahweh, and made vows to him. Now I want to say that this is worth our time to spend some time with these guys because these guys in Nineveh really ask or bring to the surface and show us that it, God's love, his mercy, his justice for the broken, for the sinners, for those that are running from him. We even see this with Jonah. His kindness to Jonah, his kindness to this crew, and God's kindness of calling Jonah to the people of Nineveh, who he did not want to go to. So God is about not just the main plot. A lot of times we look at our lives, we think of like, what's my main purpose? But there are people we meet every day that are a part of our subplot. That a lot of times we just can't see until we have God do the work that he does in our lives, convicting us and revealing to us his kind of movement, incarnational movement that he does. A lot of times I miss this. I get busy. I miss people around me in my impatience, in my hard-headedness. Can anybody relate? God was teaching Jonah and us that his kingdom is much bigger than Jonah's version of a kingdom. It's much bigger than our vision of a kingdom. So this morning, that's what I want us to do. I want to ask the question, why, why Nineveh? Why this crew? Why would God move towards them that they would profess faith? That they would do this? I think it reveals the, the, the richness and deepness and the, and the beauty of what God is after in our lives. Um, you know, so often I believe this is where God goes. This is not the places we want to go. It's not the places that churches want to go where we move towards others. As Christians, we're, uh, I would be honest with you, we're quicker to protest than protect. Christians are quicker to picket than pour our lives into someone we, that's not like us. We're so much quicker. And this morning we see uh, something unique. Uh, we see something about 
there's a commonality between us and any person we meet, whether they know God or not. And it's in this passage we see it. And there's really just two things I want us to see. I'll read our text, and I want us to see two things. is all people are religious in some way. And our faith in Jesus is for the common good. All people are religious. And our faith in Jesus is for the common good. It's not just for us. It's for those around us. So our passage is in Jonah. Let me read it again. For the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a great violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. All the sailors are afraid, and they, and each cried out to his own God, the lower G, any God. <laughs> and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell asleep, a deep sleep, it says. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. <laughs> Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that this is my fault, that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, and this is all caps, Yahweh. Then they cried to Yahweh, Please, Yahweh, you please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, Yahweh, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. And if you remember, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. He offers a prayer. Lord, as we come to this text, we ask that you would indeed engage our hearts. Would you give us just an insight that you're a God who has made us, you've, you've, you've made us as image bearers of you. You've made us as worshipers. You've made us as those, it's like the vine and branches. We have life-giving sap from you. Um, we know that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that is at the very, um, the corner. He, he holds the whole building together. Everything is set upon him. The church is. And so, Father, would you teach us even this morning, even from this text, just, just what we see in these men and what we will see with Nineveh is that we're all made to worship you. And Father, as followers of you, our hearts are to be moving towards that in others around us, all people. Father, we are made religious. We're made to, to uh, honor something greater than ourselves. And Father, would you show us this morning what it is to honor you and find our life in you and to offer that to others. Bless us now in Christ's name. Amen. So really I have two points I want to make and that is that all people really are religious and, um, and our faith in Jesus is for everyone, is for the common good. Now in verse 5 it says this, Then the mariners 
were afraid and they cried out to his God. And it's lowercase God. So it's just any kind of pagan God out there. I spent some time in, in Nepal um, a number of years ago. And I will never forget walking the streets of Kathmandu and, and meeting people. And, you know, at first I, I, I just couldn't put my head around it. There are 300 million gods that they worship. It's the Hindu religion. And what they do is most families, as I started to kind of piece it together, most families will pick three or four gods that become their primary God to kind of get them through life. If it's like, if they're going through a period of like, I know we want children, they'll pick a fertility God. Or if they need wealth, they'll pick a God that will maybe do that for that. Or if their crops are not growing, they're like, we need a God that will help our farming. I mean, seriously, it's 300 million. And Jesus was just, is just one of their kind of gods, lowercase. If you get that picture, you get the idea that that's what's going on here. These are pagans. They're religious. But they're, but they're religious. I mean, they're pagans, but they're religious. They're still like reaching to something that's outside of them. Such an important thing to note. I think a lot of times as Christians, we think, oh yeah, the people out there, they don't even, they don't want God. No, they do. We're built for God. We're made I mean, I really want us to direct kind of us to the reality that folks on the boat, we see them, they're actually afraid, and they start crying out to God. It's, and, it, and it's intense. They, they're like casting lots, they're trying to find the person who started the calamity, and they wake them up. And they were really, in the end, just crying out for, for someone greater than themselves. See, every human heart is this way. And it doesn't mean that religious things, I mean, look, think about this. It doesn't mean they do the religion we do or do the following we do. But, the, you know, it even says that 95% of the world believes that there's something outside of them, something bigger than them. I don't know if you all remember, if you've ever, probably not, I don't know if you've ever watched Bill Maher. He's just, the, or, or, you know, he's on TV, he has a show, and, he, and he's known as just mocking religion. That's his whole thing. He actually had a movie called um, Religious, where he melded the two words together, religion and ridiculous. And he had this show. But then when he was pressed and asked, he said this, just about God, do you believe, do you not believe, you're an atheist. He just said this, I don't say that there's no God. I'm not an atheist. I do not... I, he said, I do, do not like certainty. What I say is I just don't know. And I thought that was fascinating for somebody that's like, I don't believe in anything. And then you get to it and you press him on it. And he says, well, I'm not going to say there's no God. See, see look... We're, we're all, we've got some a religious nature to us. And in Romans 1, it tells us that. For the wrath of God is revealed, listen to this, it re revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, listen to this, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and, 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 their, and their foolish hearts were darkened. For they, listen to this, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Paul is just saying that being human is, in, is innately religious. We're built this way. And we will worship. You, we all worship. Every day when you wake up, you know, it's, I, I, I'll talk to people and it's like, this year is so weird with sports because everybody's, the, the, what they worship has been kind of pulled out from under them. It's kind of been fascinating during the pandemic. I mean, everybody is just losing their mind. Nobody wants to listen to crowd noise that's been pumped in for a basketball game or a football game that's coming up. But what's been revealed in some way is that 
We'll take anything. And it will be what we pay homage to. If it's sports or if it's like our hobbies or... Um, for me, I am, I'm telling you right now, I absolutely love mountain biking. I lose my mind with mountain biking. Just love it. And so I want to be on trail. I just think about it. I'll wake up and I'll, I'll, I will just confess, you know, and then what we'll do is we'll line everybody up and you can come up and do yours. But um, I'm playing. <laughs> During a pandemic, nobody can come up here, just me. So... Yeah, for me, it's like um, I will wake up and my first thought would be, what trail do I want to hit this morning? And it's not, what does it look like for me to just bask in the glory of God as I wake up again? No, I, I'm thinking about the next thing. I'm busy. So here's the thing is like in this story, you see this crew and we know this is coming. This is just a picture about Nineveh as well. And it's a picture about our own souls. And for Jonah, it was a picture of his. He worshiped his own Hebrewness over worshiping the Hebrew God. He was like, look, I'm Hebrew. I, I fear the living God. Really? I don't know about that. You love your race, Jonah. We love our stuff. And so there was a lot more commonality in a sense between Jonah and this crew and Nineveh and Israel and us. We will worship, as it says in Romans 1, we will worship, listen to this, the birds and the animals and the reptiles. He was saying, we'll worship the creation and not the creator. Here's the question for you this morning. Just identify, where do you worship the creation versus the creator? Where does it happen in the small ways, in the big ways? When you can answer that, you can get into this narrative. You can get into right there with Jonah. You can get right in here with this crew. See, when we start to see that we all struggle with this, and here's the thing, when you know that you've got the wrong religion, in a sense, you've got the wrong thing you're worshiping, it's when it's fear-based. Because a lot of times, like, as good as mountain biking is, it's never going to save my soul. It's never going to give me what I need. It's never going to satisfy me. It's not the fountain of living water that will really quench my thirst. And I know that sounds crazy, but we do that with wealth. We do that with the next friendship or the next thing that we're longing for in our marriage or whatever it is, we will worship that. And we have a lot more in common with these sailors and Nineveh and Jonah in his running. See, when we start to see when something gets taken away and I've listened, here's the thing, so when you're, when you're living in kind of like Fort Collins, I mean, like, nobody's working, you know, 18-hour days on the farm or whatever they're doing. So they're just sitting around trying to watch the next sporting event, and they're just like, man, this is just the worst, everything. They're just depressed. And there's fear. Is it ever going to come back? Are we ever going to get this back? I'm sure this is common amongst all of us with sports and life. Here's the thing we can start to see that we've kind of begun, our religion has become more about the creation than the creator, the birds and the reptiles, as it says in Romans 1, than our God himself. And we're, suppre we're suppressing the truth. And here's the thing. When those things get taken away, it reveal, it's revealed in our fear or anxiety or worry. See, if we don't live for the living God, then we'll live for so many other things. All of us, sailors and ranchers and farmers and CEOs and politicians and moms and dads and kids will all do this. So when life gets turned up and down, we start pay, kind of praying like these sailors. At first, did you notice that? They were like crying out to any God. <laughs> I just need any God. Just, just figure this thing out. See, all religion not based on the gospel is based on fear. And here's the thing that I struggle with, I forget the gospel. And in the end, we have a lot more in common, like I said. We float through life when, when things, we float through life and then when things get challenging, the praying begins. The sailors 
kind of see this. We see this. We approach God like a boss. We come to God with a lack of trust. And this is the natural bent. We don't live before Him as a father, but we live before God so often as an ogre in the sky, arms crossed with His finger pointing at us. We don't live with that kind of freedom. And, and that, that gets all kind of undone when we have the wrong thing that we're worshiping. See, a heart that is being changed by the grace of Jesus is a heart that moves from fear to freedom. Now follow me here. This must be at the core of this church. To be committed to loving Lake and the nations, we must look at our fearful hearts. And this can drive us to love those around us that have the same struggles. Whether they cry out to the right God or not, we can look at people and say, your, your fear, there's hope on the other side. It's like a beggar showing other beggars where bread is because we're that way. See, this is our world. This is our motivation. And it's, it's a, to move towards a broken world. God was teaching Jonah this. He's teaching us this. He's showing us the, the vastness of the kingdom that he's creating. So one is that we're, we're all... In some way, we're all religious and we live in fear. That gets exposed. But our faith in Jesus is then something that we can offer others. It's something that can transform those around us. Friends, the, the gospel frees us from fear and apathy. Now look again at verse 6. Um, I'll just read it, you know, verse 6, it just says, uh, The captain uh, went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God, whatever he is. Now, you remember Jonah, he's sleeping. Jonah, he is so self-absorbed that he's not even aware of the problems that's going around him. You ever been there? I can tell you right now that this preaches, I think, to all of us because... Um, because one, we many times don't know the problems around us. We don't know what someone's going through because our hearts are so drilled in on ourselves. We, we, we are, as Christians, are just kind of numb. We look at the world and we're like, oh, it's all falling apart. We can't have, you know, if we don't get this, uh, you know, uh, this piece accomplished for our country, if we don't get this piece, it's all falling apart. And so Christians then live in this kind of despair. And it's kind of like we live in the kind of despair that Jonah is where we're kind of numb and then we'll just go fall asleep to it. And we fall asleep in different ways to it. We'll go worship other created things than the creator. We won't trust the sovereign God. I've always loved the interview that Micah Assayas did with the lead singer of U2, Bono. And I've always liked, I just, I mean, I lost my mind one time. Like, it was like 2009, I got tickets to U2 at, at the Mile High Stadium, you know, it was called Mile High then. And, and then he like had a bike rack, like in New York, he was like cycling, road biking, he fell and like, they had to cancel the whole series and I had to wait another year <laughs> for my <laughs> religious experience of Bono, you know, it's like so bad. <laughs> it was all revealed right, right there. I was like, what? But here's the thing. There's this great quote, it's a great book, but it's just an interview. Micah Sayas with Bono, and he started. To, he just kind of asked him, like, "Can you talk about Christians and what's going on with them?" And 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 Bono, who's a Christian, claims to be a Christian. He just says this: Zealots often have no love. He's saying people that are followers, zealots, have no love for the world. Kind of made me start thinking about Jonah. It made me start thinking about this. But he said, "No love for the world. They're just getting through it to get to the next one." It's a favorite topic. It's the old cliche. Eat junk now, pie in the sky when you die. Bono keeps saying this. He says, but I take Christ at his word on earth as it is in heaven. 
In my experience, the older you get, the less chance you have to transform your life, the less open you are to love in a challenging way. You tend towards love that is more comforting and safe. Now, Bono's just kind of revealing something. He's saying a lot of times when you look at the church, when you look at Christians who have this incredible change agent in life, a God who would move the ends of the world to enter time, space, and history, become, come in the incarnation, and we would just be numb to transform us who love other gods to move towards us. That was the Pharisees. Who was, who was Jesus the hardest on? It was the Pharisees. And you know what I, I, I've always thought and believed? It was Jack Miller and it was this uh, discipleship that I went through. They just described all Christians as recovering Pharisees. We're all recovering Pharisees. Who is Jesus the hardest on? Pharisees. Because they were kind of close to the God, but they were worshiping their own religiosity. And what were they not doing? They were not loving the poor and the needy and the broken. Not in the way that God calls us. So this is Jonah. He was more comforted and safe in his self-righteousness. He's asleep, as we said. He didn't like people that were different than him racially or culturally or socially. Jonah did not understand the fullness of Yahweh's heart, God's heart. A heart that is shaped by the gospel that we know in the New Testament. God, the gospel pushes us beyond ourselves and pushes us out in love. He, bless, here, he blesses us with the gospel to spin us out to be a blessing to those around us. He blesses us to be a blessing. But we're so often at the bottom just sleeping. My, heart, my life is hard, filled with pains, too painful for anyone to even care about. I'm going through too much right now. My life is way too heavy. Now, I'm not trying to guilt manipulate. I'm just trying to say this is what we do. <laughs> I know everyone is struggling with something. It's weighing us down. But there's hope. And it comes in a God who serves us, like I said, in the incarnation. He gets in our shoes and invites us to get into the shoes of others. The very thing that does not seem possible. Now, let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you a little story, and then I'll wrap things up. But I'll never forget, my brother had, uh, I think I've told you this before, but he was a professional ballroom dancer. He and his wife owned a studio in Scottsdale, Arizona, until about 2010. And then he moved to Korea, started a whole different career. But he, he had this dance studio. He had a client one time walk in. And she was as sickly as you've ever seen someone. And, you know, being there in Arizona, she had been, she had been ravaged by cancer, going through therapy. And, and they got rid of the cancer, but it left her body just beaten up. And she shows up to the dance studio. She had a friend say, you need to go to do something. You need to move out of like what you're doing every day and just sleeping in and all. She was like, you ought to go try a dance studio. So she shows up and my brother was like, oh my gosh, uh, she looks awful. She's just sickly, weak, comes in. Well, after she spent about two years getting training and learning how to dance, barely could move the first few lessons. There was this transformation. It was a remarkable turnaround. Her health was such a change. She started competing. She was in her 60s too, by the way. I mean, this is not like, oh, she's 20 and like, because I... I'm like 47 and I get hurt and I'm thinking, I guess it's over. You know, it's like, I'm like I don't know if I'm going to recover. This lady's like 65. But here's the thing. She just started moving again. And that kind of physical picture of movement, it's also a spiritual thing. She started competing, dancing. Even the Mayo Clinic said, we want to do a study on how ballroom dancing can be a form of therapy. It's kind of fascinating. I don't know how that all worked out, but that's what, that's what my brother was telling me. I was like, that is incredible. She got out of bed. She left the safe place. 
and began through her pain move. Think about that. Like I said, in the incarnation, it, it even says in Philippians 2 that Jesus left everything that was comfortable and entered suffering. That movement displays the beauty and the love of God that he's in, injecting into us. Here's the principle. When we get our mind off ourselves, even for a moment, it frees us to have a, a love for God and a love for others. When we move from navel-gazing to being other-centered, it transforms us. Yes, we'll get exhausted. People are exhausting. Things are exhausting. But it's amazing when if, if are those moments where you're like, why was that service project so good? Why was that thing when I just help that out. Why did that, you know what it does? It creates gratitude in us. It transforms us. It, it, it really is. When we talk about the God who enters time and space in history, we see it was the love that was set before him that he endured the cross. He's made us in his image. And this is what Jonah's learning. This is an invitation to us. When he gave up his life, even when he said, just throw me in. He had no idea there was going to be a big fish. It was going to be three days and three nights, which was just a picture of the cross. He had no idea that he was about to be thrown into incarnational ministry as he was going to go to Nineveh and preach to see those people, like the people in the boat, transformed by Yahweh. Friends, if you want to know the main narrative of even Israel's sin throughout all of the history, it was that they didn't love. They oppressed the poor. They didn't love the widowed and fatherless. They were not giving their lives away. And here's the beauty, and don't miss it, is going out and serving doesn't make God like us. God loves us as a father would love. But here's what we see in his fatherly love. He sends his own son, as we said, to enter brokenness and depression, to enter bigotry and hatred and self-righteousness, and even become that sin for us, as it says in, in Corinthians, and love the world around us. There's a great quote as we talk about the prodigal, uh, you know, the prodigal prophet. There's a great quote about the prodigal son by Henry Nouwen. If you've never read his book, you should. It's called The Return of the Prodigal Son. It is just an amazing book. Henry Nouwen wrote it. And he's, as he's reflecting on the prodigal son, he points out that we rarely get the perspective of the father in the story. We're always thinking I'm the younger brother, older brother, but the father in the story. And Henry Nouwen writes this. He goes, The time has come to claim your true vocation to be a father who can welcome his children home without asking them any questions and without wanting anything from them in return. You see, the gospel shows us our sin and our dependency, but it also pushes us out to love in the way that the father loves. Calling others as like beggars showing other beggars where bread is. We all have common sins and common longings. We, every person you meet in some way has a religious bent. And when God has done the work in you to show you the true Yahweh, the true Lord, the true Je you know, Jehovah, as we see in the scripture, God himself, it should then pour over, spill over, not to prove anything to God, not to even prove anything to ourselves, but it should just be a natural thing we want to pour ourselves into others, to love others as we love ourselves. Think about how this can change your heart towards the broken in the, your community around you and your neighbors. It might, die, it might invite you into that conversation. See, our narrative will shift from our anger, maybe politics, hurts, wounds, fears, anxieties to a father's heart of love for crazy sailors, <laughs> pagan nations, the broken in our community. May this be our heart, all because of what we see in Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We're reminded again. 
just of your rich mercy, that you're slow to anger, abounding in love, love and kindness. Father, we just come and we come with just humility. And even as we come to this table, we're reminded that you're the one that feeds us. That, uh, that our confession is that we worship other things. And like the sailors and, and the Ninevites, you call us as a father back to yourself. Open arms. Father, would you transform our hearts with that reality and truth and that, that reality and truth would move into from our head into our hands and our feet as we incarnationally love those around us with the gospel of Jesus. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.